music recommendations. Yes. We can finally talk about music on this podcast. Sean, let's go ahead. Um, so I have two artists that I've listened to a bunch, you know, my little, my little indie jams. So first one that I didn't realize that his album came out last year. I thought it came out at the beginning of this year, but it's uh, Gus Stafferton. He's a musician around our age um, out of, I'd like to say, New York area. Um, I could be wrong. But anyways, um, he kind of blew up the past couple of years. He had stuff on the Netflix show, 13 Reasons Why. He got like um, one a, a special track on there and some other stuff that he's been um, going on. A very unique indie sound of like mixing, synth- mixing a lot of heavy synthesizers and being like a Tame Impala, Jack of All Trades, where he produces everything himself. But anyways, he had an album that was released September of last year called uh, Orca that is just fantastic. Um, top to bottom, really, really good. The song that got me like uh, to notice him a lot was Medicine. It's just an amazing indie track about addiction, overcoming it, and all the stuff that happens within it, and the production, everything in there, the emotion, the lyricism. is just a really, really good track. But it's... Um, his artists I'm going to be really following now to see, but that whole album, Orca, um, you have First Day, that's a great, uh, good track. Palms in the middle of the album that are good too. So um, he's somebody that I've been looking at a little while now um, that I want to talk about more on the podcast and to bring it more out to the people instead of just the, the little indie circles and stuff. Um, and then my other rec- rec- recommendation, if I could speak, is Japanese Breakfast. Um, why indie girls like to make random stuff about Japanese stuff? Who knows? But yeah, because it's not to be confused with a Japanese hat. No, we've talked about a lot. Exactly. Um, which we've talked about Amber a lot from um, the Japanese house. But Japanese Breakfast. Um, she's a artist that she's been making music for for some time. We mentioned um, her a little bit. We've done like a single of hers here or there. I, I think so. Well, maybe, but I don't really remember much. But. There is a single called um, Be Sweet that came out a last month of an album that she should be uh, releasing later this year. That's yes. super fucking we did that. catchy. Did we do that yes, one? Yes, we did. We did. Yes, okay. it was really good. Um, and then, the with, because I don't remember ever talking about like her discography or much before, because I think all of her stuff was re- were released before Audio Face. Because um, I think her last album was in 2017. Yeah. But there's a lot from, because um, it's on uh, my listening history the past like mo- like couple months. You have a uh, soft sounds from another planet album that's really really good. Um, I think that came out say in like July of seventeen or maybe May of seventeen. So it's pretty early on the podcast, so we didn't we gotta get to it. But I've been listening to that album a lot, and I wanted to kind of get more into her music and stuff throughout. It, and I'm really looking forward to her um, her uh, album later uh, this year. So those are my two artists. Yeah. Um. Mine are, this is my like, I, my least contributions to any audio face episode of all time. But, um, <laughs> one I'm going to go with is Sad Night Dynamite. They released a self-titled album, I believe, earlier this year. And Annie, friend of the show, describes mm-hmm. it as emo gorillas. And I'd say, it's, I guess it's, it, it's not really emo, let's say, but sort of like emotional and moody. And it's the sound of gorillas' first album, but done a, like, so it's kind of like dubby and mm-hmm. slower in that way. But like most renditions on Gorilla's first album that have been done more recently, I think it's an improvement over that sound. Um, In general, going in there, there's just a bunch of songs in there. I think Kill Shot might be the lead single kind of one, but it's just like a sometimes synthy, sometimes trappy thing, but it's darker and more modern. Even on Parlophone, the same record label. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So... That makes things very... um, Parthophone's had a lot of uh, decent artists come out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Great uh, come up, rising from the ghost ship of EMI. Mm. Never forget. (laughs) Never forget EMI records. Um, There's this actually a piece of like gorilla's art that shows like the Titanic sinking ship with the um, red EMI square on it. (laughs) (laughs) And and, like Murdoch peeking out with his like um, telescope. (laughs) Jamie Hewlett loves to bite where... (laughs) Loves to eat where um, the food's fed. I I don't know what the saying is. Um, so yeah, that's very good. The next one I'm going to go for is Lab, who came out with the album Lab 4. Um, what is... Let me go back here, because that's not it. I am trying to remember off the top of my head who showed me this, but either way, it is... I don't know a ton of them off the top of my head, but they released this song, and it's kind of like a lot of instrumental-ish, airy sort of things. Okay. Um, yeah. You have a singer in the background, and... 
it's I call it indie with a little bit of sunken funk and soul on the inside. Okay. But it's really chill. I like it. There's even some acoustic versions of songs near the end as well you'll get. But it's just like very clean. It's very like feels not like Daft Punk level like we recorded it with all yeah, the things yeah. from the 70s. But it has that old school kind of flavor and sound to it. Um, yeah, especially with Yes I Do. Okay. It feels n nicely modern to it though. Yeah. Um, but the audience, you've been sending us things, as we've asked to so nicely, uh, that have been different musical things you've been listening into. So we'll take a look at some of those. Yeah, so um, one of them that I've gotten a lot of requests to do is... Uh, we did talk about uh, with Taylor Swift, because she had two albums pretty close together last year, Folklore and Evermore. We talked, I, might have, I talked a little bit about Evermore um, last year, so um, you can go search up old audio faces for that but then this is something interesting that we've talked about with her for a while is her like having to re-record her older work because the, her label is holding her hostage basically so she's having to re-record a bunch of her stuff so she's been releasing singles and other stuff and now she has like a whole track list of her upcoming new old album that should be released maybe next month or something um but the interesting thing is um, with all of her new recorded stuff, it's cool. Like you have uh, love uh, anything that's like uh, um, uh, you have love story, which is Taylor's version. So it's her version of her older work, but now having to do it again, which is which super is, wild. Which is crazy because she shouldn't fucking have to do that in the first place. But yeah, record labels are assholes. We've known about that for a while. But the interesting thing to, for me um, as a big uh, music nerd is that. Hearing somebody, you know, have a previous recorded work and having to redo it again is how different they are now. Like, especially with the voice and the vocals, because she was very, very young when she did all of that work before. So now we can hear her, her um, voice mature and I actually like it a little bit more because of the way her voice is now compared to how it was before. Yeah, that's something you never get to you hear with artists. You never get to hear. Because usually, like, and no. you, you hear, and it's a cool thing, you get to hear an artist as a time capsule exactly. of when they were as they were. You don't really get to hear, like, Kanye West doing late registration era stuff ever again because that's just a bygone time that just is exactly time capsule. or like you this have is a radiohead totally radiohead will barely touch pablo honey here at their live shows but it's like a whole different now she's having to redo it so it's cool i really haven't seen it fairly often or really ever from a big artist to uh, redo their stuff so um yeah something to check out i think yeah um We'll also Ooh. go to the hold steady with open door policy. Yes. Um, which is something that I saw earlier a couple like month or so ago. I think it came in February, I believe. Yeah. But just like, you know, this podcast. There's weeks yeah. where there's too much to review and then there's weeks where there's goddamn nothing. Yeah. So um it's really good. Like the hold steady, I need to know more about them, but I've just like kind of known about them in my head for quite a while. Um, at least since like two thousand six, right? Um, I think even a little bit earlier. And this album is a very sort of like, you know, they're older now, so a lot of the writing is very spoken word, but the it's instrumentation... Very, a lot of spoken word, that, yeah, instrumentation is fantastic. Phenomenal. Very, very um, really good. If I Could Get Spices, the song, this like is the second, second song one, yeah, yeah. on there, yeah. really captures like the sound they're going for mm -hmm. right now, and it just plays really nicely. Yeah, I normally don't like spoken word stuff, uh, because I think it can distract from the music. It's cool to have here or there, like Beck, or even 21 Savage, where you can have kind of spoken one stuff here or there, but... For it, for a big chunk of the album, you need to have everything else be perfect, and that's how this album is. Where everything else around it makes sense, is great. Everything's cohesive within that, and the lyrics of all the spoken word parts for most of the tracks are very good too. So it's a great album. Yeah, I liked it a lot. One thing we did for our music recommendations was ask for things regardless if they were new or not, just see like what people mm -hmm. were listening to. And so um, one person sent in Weezer's Blue album. It's playing at saying so. Now this is a Weezer's older stuff. So which this I'm is this is a little it, more partial. To. Which is fine. That's the that's that's good Weezer. That's that's pre Pacific Daydream Weezer. <laughs> we got pre and post Pacific Daydream Weezer. Well, we'll 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 compare um great things like Say It Ain't So from the Blue Album. That's just like wonderful pieces Fantastic of like nineties rock. Yeah. Compared to Van Weezer, which I think is a new album that's coming out later oh, this year, and we'll no. talk about a band and how they kind of grow and succeed over time and. Things they maybe should or shouldn't. But Blue Album's good. Blue Album's yeah. phenomenal. It's like it's still a banger even today. Um, I think Buddy Holly's on there too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's one I just threw in there, so I don't blame you if you don't know about it. Mm -hmm. But here's AJR, who I'd heard about a little bit 
Um, I feel like I know AJR yeah. from something. They released an album, OK Orchestra, that came out fairly recently this year. Mm -hmm. And it's weird, like, the on the album cover, the characters, like, the <laughs> band members almost look like nutcrackers. Like, they look like those, like, old sort of puppets. And it kind of creates an addition to this orchestral sort of, like, addition into oh, it. Oh, I know the song Bane, that's why. Yeah. Okay. Um, Bang's a really popular one, mm. but I don't love the popular one, so I'm going to go to the second song, Bummerland, which I love because it really gets to the orchestral nature of it. You have mm -hmm. a really wild, like, string section in the middle, and it just, like, goes hard. Um, while you have some, like, really approachable kind of, like, boy band pop kind of deal going on, but you get that extra layer of, like, proper instrumentation, like an orchestral thing, and that's the stuff we talk about on Audio Face all the, all the time. That's really cool. Um, cool. You, do you want to go, I, I saw you looking at this, I wasn't sure if you heard about it, but the Tatsuro Yamashita. I was looking at it. Um, I didn't. Really, I didn't get a chance to really look at it. So, because I know it's all in Japanese. Yeah, I got to listen to it. It's all in Japanese. I would love to tell you the names. And I definitely can't read this language anymore. Um, but I, mean, I need to go to mom. And be like, yeah. What, what says this? Tatsuro Yamashita. Um, I guess was a composer along with a couple of other folks on an album Pacific, which you can find on Spotify with Shigeru Suzuki and Huru Omi Hoson Hosono. And together, this music is. It sounds like early 2000s alternative rock all of a sudden, like really randomly. Like there are some things in here that sound like they could have been like, not Plastic Beach demos because they sound like completed out works, yeah. but there are songs that sound like pre-Plastic Beach almost. Oh, okay. That's really cool. I like the second one the most. It kind of felt like the perfect sort of seafaring sort of like s seafaring song, but like it's also kind of oddly, you know, bubbly, almost like the credits of a late 2000s like Japanese anime. Was continuing to the next episode. Yeah, it's really cool. I, I love that. Like, our any like we get to peek into what our listeners are listening to. And there's just totally different vibes here and there. Um, and then the last one over here is the Jungle album, which I'm only going to assume is the self-titled Jungle album from um, the band 2013, like by the band Jungle. Yeah. That was like disco funk soul kind of deal. Um, that's really good. I didn't, around that time, 2014, uh, July 2014, uh, wow, my brain, I remember exactly what July 2014 was like generally, but, um, <laughs> it was a really, it was a bunch of, like, really good music that came out that really made me feel optimistic about what well, that's, music could be in the early 2010s, and there was, like, kind of, like, the crest of a lot of it that was happening. Well, that's there. right when, um, like, electronic music was kind of blowing up in the U.S. in a more of a mainstream style. That's when we, I think we went to Hard Summer that year as well. Yeah. That might have been July or August of 14, and I was like, well, I'm shocked at how many people are here and stuff, so, um, at least that's, like, my, my head of that. Oh, my God. Of course I remember this. Because uh, one of my favorite songs on here, uh, Julia by mm. Jungle, was remixed by Soul Wax or Soul so, Child, so, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like one of my favorite like remixes in general. Um, but yeah, th that's a really good track. I love listening to just like um, the original version of that too because I've listened to the remix so much. And oh, Bob no, is a banger on um, XL recordings. Ooh, yeah. Folks, folks, we love our XL recordings. We love our extra own. large recordings. We love our extra large. Um, that was a really like you know different curveball, nice sort of journey through music we don't always listen to or music no. not necessarily new that we just got to kind of enjoy here and sit in our little music club. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Our on. music book club. Well, this is FDS for music. <laughs> this is what I've tricked myself into doing. <laughs>